Yorin wastes no time in binding Hakon. He gags him, blindfolds him, he ties his hands, he ties his feet, he ties his hands to his feet. Human rights, as he sees it, are for people that deserve to be called human. The company takes a minute to regroup, bind their wounds, and catch their breath. They put a little distance between them and the place Hakon was captured, and Kara and Amos take an extra long time covering their tracks. When they are ready, Alexander has Hakon brought to him. He keeps Hubert and Yorin close at hand. He ungags Hakon, lays his sword across the priest's chest, and asks him one simple question. Where is she? Out of your reach, Hakon tells him. Alexander backhands Hakon across the face. Where is she? Hakon spits blood. Hubert cautions the priest that he really doesn't want to be trying Alexander's patience here. He reminds Alexander that, if needed, he can begin applying pressure to the Vlari High Priest. Hakon sneers, says he is unafraid of pain. Hubert just chuckles, a touch too jovially. He observes that physical pain is just one of many types of torture. Hakon says this is irrelevant. I have yielded, he says. Too much of my work is yet unfinished. I will not die for trivial matters such as this. If you spare my life, I will tell you what you want to know. Alexander grinds his teeth when Hakon refers to Elena as trivial, but agrees to spare him, at least for now. Hakon tells them that Elena is on his ship. It's not far, he was heading towards it already. His ship is docked at Smuggler's Cove, surrounded by a Spartic fleet. Out of your reach, he says again. He smiles cruelly. Yorin laughs in the priest's face, wiping the smirk away in an instant. He looks to Alexander. Night Raid? He says. Alexander nods. Night Raid. They gag Hakon and throw him on a horse. Amos leads them down to the shore, well away from Smuggler's Cove. As they have confirmed, the outlaw's den is now crawling with a small army of Svards. Instead, they find a small, rocky shore that can only be accessed by a narrow defile, just wide enough for a horse to traverse. From this position, using Varley's looking glass, they can see the Spartic fleet. Hakon wasn't kidding. Scores of longships are docked at the cove, and scores more bob up and down in the bay, disappearing in the distance. There's no mistaking Hakon's ship. It's huge, imposing. Shallow drafted compared to middish trade vessels, but substantially deeper than the average longship. Most of all, it looks familiar, since Yorin and Alexander saw it moored off the shores of the Iron Blood River in Yerevan. It's moored near the shore at Smuggler's Cove, presumably waiting for Hakon's return. Yorin and Alexander have the company begin cutting old trees and gathering fallen logs. By the time night falls, they have their plan in place. Most of Steelshod and the Sons remain on the rocky shore with Hakon. The strike team consists of Yorin and his stealth crew, Prudence, Chauncey, Kara, Hubert, and Amos. Also Alexander and a few of the foot warriors, Gunnar, Leona, Bear, Pierre, Robin, and Gwyneth. They strip down to a bare minimum of armor and weaponry, and wade out into the bay. They begin their amphibious assault, using the felled logs as floating devices. Swimming along the shore in the dark of night, approaching Hakon's ship from sea rather than land. Inviting Chauncey was a misstep. He professes to be doing okay, but he rapidly grows exhausted after a few minutes of swimming. Despite her best efforts, Prudence is a small woman with zero body fat. She too struggles. Alexander opted to bring probably more armor than was wise, 
so he is also relying heavily upon the logs to keep him afloat. Fortunately, Gunnar swims like he was born in the water. Hubert is a strong swimmer too. After all, he's naturally buoyant. They do what they can to help the others, as do Joran and Kara, who are probably the next two best swimmers. It's a long, arduous process. By the time they drift up to the base of Hakon's ship, thankfully unnoticed, some of them are already exhausted. But the night raid is just beginning. Joran is the first one up the side of the ship, he dispatches a sentry immediately, guiding the Svard down to the deck as his life's blood bubbles up out of his throat. He drops a rope and the others begin pulling themselves up. They work their way through a few of the sentries, but it only takes one small slip for an alarm to go out. Svards begin shouting from the holds below and rushing up to fight, and on shore, shouts go out as the Svards begin responding to the cries. Steelshod moves across the deck of the ship like a well-oiled machine cutting down the disorganized Svards as they try to respond to the unknown threat. A couple of Hakon's elite guards, the morale-immune zealots, rush out to fight off the invaders as well. They are joined by a battle-hardened Svardic war leader, the interim captain of Hakon's ship. Even so, the fight is short-lived. Steelshod focuses down the elites with sustained massive damage, most of the heavy melee go to the edge of the ship to repel any boarders that wade out from the shore. Kara and some of the archers position themselves to shoot over the side, while Joran, Alexander, Gunnar, and Hubert descend to the lower deck. Hakon's ship is tiered. Below deck, the thralls are kept. Dozens of them, the core rowers chained to their oars. We need a detour here. Sorry, but it's important. See, the players wanted to add in more PCs. They'd rolled them up a while ago for fun. Both players used the same roll set. A standard rule of mine when rolling, I let both players use whichever of the two sets they prefer. A middling set of stats with 118 and 15 to round it out. Alexander's player has created Felix Wren, a middish knight from Chatsworth whose family hails from the Mords of Highhurst. He speaks with a brogue. He's a no-nonsense, arrogant prick. Trained with a longbow, but not as a bowman in the line shooting volleys. He's a hunter. A sniper. High dexterity. Low charisma. Felix was captured by Ter Bjornsson's forces during the early days of the invasion in the south, taken after he was wounded defending Chatsworth's keep, chained to an oar for a few months now. From Joran's player, we get Zelda. A Kriegar warrior wants a champion for her Jarl. Her Jarl was killed by Ter Bjornsson, and stubborn as she is, she refused to bow to the new Jarl of Svarden and Kriegany. Zelda is built like a fireplug. Short, broad, dense. She's especially adept at axe fighting, but she's dumber than a bag of hammers. High strength, low intelligence. Zelda has been in Hakon's ship for many months, chained to Felix recently. About half the time, she calls him Fritz, I guess because it sounds kinda like Felix to her, and she's grown very fond of him. She's actually very fond of anyone who isn't her obvious enemy. Very naive, friendly, and cheerful. Her favorite response to inquiries is to grin broadly, nod, and give an enthusiastic yeah. Felix and Zelda have been hatching a plan to escape for some time, but now they sense their moment. They hear the commotion above. Their two guards look up, wondering if they should join in the fight. Zelda snaps the manacles they've been wearing down for months. They both leap to their feet and rush the guards. Zelda pounds one of them into paste with an oar, Felix scoops up a fallen sword and skewers the other guard in a quick exchange of blows. They turn to the steep stairs that lead up. The corpse of one of Hakon's elite tumbles down the stairs, preceding Joran and Alexander, following behind weapons ready. A momentary pause where both pairs stare at each other. Remember, same players. Alexander tells them they're free. Felix snorts, says no shit, they just freed themselves. 
Alexander has no time for this. He pushes past them, heading for the stern chambers below decks. Cordoned off quarters with a lock on the door. Hubert and Gunnar take a moment to speak with Zelda, Felix, and the other oarsmen, trying to explain the situation. Joran and Alexander unlock the door to the private rooms. They find a cramped corridor and a series of tiny cells. The first cell they find holds a filthy, bedraggled man. He cowers, confused and delirious, clad only in rags that were once the vestments of a Tarathi priest. Alexander and Joran begin throwing open all the cells. More men and women, former priests, now little more than broken shells of their former selves. They almost don't recognize her, but Alexander has been stealing himself for precisely this. So when he sees Elena, filthy, caked in dried blood, clothes torn, cowering like the others, he stops. His shoulders sag. He drops to her side, gently reaching out for her, murmuring her name. She looks up at him, confusion at first, and fear, but a flicker of recognition, of hope. Alexander? She asks. Yeah, I'm stopping here. That's probably a dick move, but oh well. Some of you may be amused to hear... I'll be gaming with the guys this coming Sunday, for the first time in way too long, because yes, this campaign is still ongoing. Though this is the amusing bit, most likely the entire session will be devoted to a scene, in a location I've never mentioned, with PCs that have not appeared yet, and no members of Steelshod present, facing threats that none of you even know exist. I thought it was funny anyway. Thank you for tuning in to Steelshod. A series by Mostly Writes, narrated by Tailforge. You can find every chapter in text format, as well as character sheets, setting information, maps, and rule documents on the Steelshod tabletop system in the link below. If you'd like to support the channel, you can pop down to the description and use the Patreon link for recurring donations, the PayPal.me link for one-time donations, the Teespring link for shirts with the incredibly cool background art by Nobody, or use the DriveThruRPG affiliate link the next time you're looking to try a new system. If you'd like to support the author, you can find Steelshod merch on the MostlyWrites.com store, or donate to the Mostly Rights Patreon, which are both linked on reddit.com slash r slash MostlyWrites down below.